Session two, part one. Today we're going to look at storage systems. There's a lot of questions in your exams about storage systems, so it's worth spending a bit of time looking at the requirements for them. So at the end of this part of the session, I want you all to be able to describe what is done to keep the water in the system clean, cool, and minimise the risk of stagnation. Explain how the system should be positioned in relation to the roof and as well as the board that it should be sat on. All plastic systems should be sat on a board. And describe where connections should be made to the system in relation to the water level and to each other. So this is the key things for this session. In the domestic property, cold water storage systems are either used to provide water to a hot water cylinder or cold water appliances and sometimes both. Okay, the, if it's feeding water to cold water appliances, it would be an indirect cold water system like we discussed in the last session. Feeding expansion systems might also be found in the loft. They're often much smaller uh, and they'd be used to feed water to an open vented heating system. We'll look at that in much more detail, a little bit in the hot water module, the next module, and certainly in a lot more detail in the heating module in a couple of, uh, couple of modules time. Okay, so we're going to look at cold water storage systems in particular in this in this session. Okay, so some of the regulations um, around systems are, um, well, they're written by RAS, as we know, um, the water regulations, water supply and fitting regulations um, set out how we should um, keep systems, install systems to keep the water fresh, clean and cold. OK. This is some of the examples we can see on the right, right hand side here. Uh, if you've got an open vented hot water cylinder um, fitted, the vent pipe should vent into the system um, and that should be tightly sleeved to make sure that there's there's no ingress of, of dust or, or anything else around where the vent pipe goes in. Again, um, you must have a, a vent on the system, a screened vent, and that's to allow air in essentially to, to sort of keep the system at what we describe as atmospheric pressure. Um, I always sort of describe it as this uh, Capri Sun effect. If you if you have like one of these juice boxes or, or Capri Sun, and you and you take juice out of it, the the container collapses, and potentially the same thing could happen if a system was completely sealed. Um, you could have water flowing out of it, which would create negative pressure, which could cause the system to collapse in on itself. So what we must always make sure um, we have fitted is an air vent to allow air in to keep the, the, the system at, at atmospheric pressure. We must always have a screened overflow. Uh, that's in case um, the, the inlet control device fails, the, the float valve fails, uh, and that would allow water to flow out of the system uh, and, and stop it from overflowing and, and ruining, ruining your house, essentially. We'd also have an automatic means of water control, which would normally be a float operated valve. And these all need to be positioned in particular uh, places to make sure that, that the system works as it should do. Before a float operated valve, we must always have a means of isolation, a service valve, so we can maintain the float valve if needs be. And we also would need to be able to access the system. So we must have a securely fixed tight fitting lid on there um, so we can so we can access for cleaning and for maintenance of the float valve. Another thing worth noting, you can see on here, uh, you can actually see a service valve on the outlet. All outlets from a cold water storage system must have a means of isolation on them. Um, so you can work on Pipe, pipe work downstream without having to, to drain the whole system. system. Okay, 
So that's a lot of the key information covered on the first slide. We're going to go back over it over the rest of the slides as we go through. OK. You can find uh, more information as well as in the water regulations in BSE and 806 and, and BS 8558 around um, installation and design of hot and cold water systems. OK. <clears throat> What regulations tell us to ensure there's qual the, the quality of the water in the system, they must be made of approved materials. So generally speaking, that's going to be plastic these days. Um, they must be insulated and they must be kept cool. They must be kept in a, in a uh, so they don't, so the water temperature doesn't rise. It's, the temperature stated in the regs is 25 degrees C is the absolute maximum temperature um, that water should be allowed to reach um, in a cold water system. It actually says ideally kept, keep it under 20 degrees C, but 25 degrees is the absolute maximum. So when we insulate um, our systems, we do it to, to stop them from getting too hot because it can get very hot in the in the attic, um, but we also do it to stop it from freezing. Okay. Uh, as I've already said, systems must have a lid, um, which will exclude light and also sort of should be tightly fitting so it stops any birds or, or vermin um, or dust getting into the cold water storage system. Um, they must have vents, like I've already stated as well, a screened air vent um, to stop insects and particles getting in. So that's the purpose of the screen. And again, as I've already stated, uh, if it has a vent pipe coming up from the hot water cylinder, it should be sealed with a rubber rubber grommet to make sure that that it can it can go in and it, and it remains sealed. Also, another thing worth noting, okay, when you, if you do put a vent pipe in, that shouldn't project down um, very far. It should literally just go into the system lid, uh, and maybe by 25 mil. Um, and not project down um, any further than the, than the inlet. OK. So when it comes to positioning systems, OK, uh, we need to position systems carefully. OK. The key sizes with regards to the position, it should be no closer than 350 mil to the to the roof and that's so we can get into the float valve to to maintain it if needs be um, and then on the other side it should be at least 500 mil clearance so we can get into the to the system itself to carry out cleaning and all systems and this is key right all systems must be fully supported across the entire base using something that's going to be resistant to water. So that could be marine ply uh, or, or timber, either either is fine. And they, it needs to be fully supported across the entire base, plus an extra 150 mil on each side. Sometimes, and this isn't a regulatory requirement, um, you might remove insulation from underneath the system and that's essentially to, to allow some of the, the heat from the house below to sort of gently warm the system to, to prevent freezing during the winter. So for our connections connected to systems, there's lots of different connections we're going to need to make. Generally, like I've already said, generally speaking, our inlet would be connected by a, a float operated valve. And the outlets we'd make with tank connectors. Uh, the overflow uh, would be connected as well, and that's as we've said to remove any extra water should the float, float valve fail. Okay, we would make our connections using a hole saw. We need to make a correct sized hole using a hole saw. Always make them just a tiny little bit bigger than the thing that they need to go through. Okay. Generally, another thing worth noting, really, um, generally speaking, so if we're going to use rubber washers or plastic washers to make sure that that everything remains watertight uh, when we when we fit these connections in there. 
And another thing we're showing actually, um, it's useful to fit some, what's called a stiffener plate. Some people call it a back plate, some people call it a stiffener plate, where, where the float valve goes through, and that essentially prevents it sort of oscillating and and um, damaging the system essentially over over time. Overflows uh, they need to be screened. That prevents sort of insects or dust being sort of blown uh, into the the system. Also, another thing that they do um, to prevent the uh, to prevent sort of wind blowing dust through is they actually turn the they turn it down into the water. They call it a dip pipe. So they turn that down into the water, and that essentially sort of helps prevent sort of things being blown. Up the up the overflow. The key size for overflows, and actually a key size in general for for cold water storage systems, is 25 mil. The overflow pipe should be positioned 25 mil above what's known as the finished water level. We call it the finished water level because if a cold water storage system is feeding a hot water cylinder, the water in the hot water cylinder when it heats up will expand. And as it expands, it actually expands, the, the water gets pushed back up through the cold feed and can cause the water level in the system to rise. So what we need to do when we set our, our, our sizes um, for our warning pipe, etc., cetera, um, we need to make sure that we take into consideration the expansion of water. Uh, in, in that size, okay? For our inlet, okay, our inlet should be at least 25 mil above the overflow. Like I say, 25 mil is a key number for systems. If you get any questions in your test, if in doubt, pick 25, okay? So it would have an SG air gap, which basically means that you've got a, a round overflow with at least 25 mil of a gap between the, the inlet and the, and the overflow. Okay, and the overflow should be sized actually to make, like, like I think I've already said, um, to make sure that it can cope with the flow of water should the inlet control device fail. So basically, generally speaking, that's like you'd make it one size larger than the inlet. So if you have a 15 mil pipe coming in, you'd have a 22 mil overflow. If you had 22 mil pipe going in, you'd have at least a 28 mil overflow, etc. etc. Okay. Um, so yeah, service valves, as I've already said, would be fitted on the inlet for servicing of the float valve and on the outlet so you can work downstream without having to drain the whole system. Okay. For outlets. Ideally, this is a bit of a tricky one because it's not something that people always do in, in real life, but according to the water regulations, ideally we should take all connections from the base of the system. This isn't always practical and in, in reality, most people will take their connections from the side, but it's recommended in the water regulations that we take all of our connections from the base into the base of the system, okay? And this is a tank connector here. Uh, this is what we'd use to, to make our connections, to take our, our, our cold feed off, our cold distribution off. And it would be sealed with a rubber or a plastic washer, okay? Um, don't use oil-based jointing compounds because they will degrade the system. Anything oil-based will, will break down plastic, okay? Uh, if we have lots of connections, if we have more than one connections, we should make them at opposite ends, and that's to encourage through flow of water uh, and minimise the risk of stagnation. And ideally, we should always take our cold feed connection, the one which is, is feeding the hot water cylinder, um, off above our cold distribution, and that's essentially to help prevent scalding. Um, if the mains get switched off for whatever reason um, and people are, for example, have been using water throughout the day, um, the water level will, will start to fall in the system. And say, for example, someone was having a shower 
with a with a manual um, shower valve. The water levels fall in here. If it fell below the, the cold distribution, the cold would switch off and then you just have hot water coming through and somebody could get scalded. So if you take your cold feed, which fills, fills up your hot water, water side, um, up, up, off above the cold distribution, that means that the hot will switch off first and the worst that will happen is someone will get cold rather than get burnt. Okay. So it's just a, it's not a regulatory requirement, but it's something that's considered good practice, okay? So connecting systems, uh, if systems are linked, they should be, uh, they should be connected with two pipes, okay, one at low level and one at sort of medium level, essentially. Um, if you only have one outlet, ideally, or one inlet, sorry, you should make sure that the outlets are in the furthest system from the inlet. Okay. Another, there's another method of connection here. You can see you've got two inlets and and two outlets there. Okay. So it's you want to try and make sure that you try and prevent stagnation. You, you get water flowing equally from, from both of them um, if you have two float valves or if you have one float valve you need to make sure that the freshest water well the, the oldest water gets used up first so it's not going to stagnate essentially okay uh, a couple of points to note if a cold water storage system and an FNE are fitted alongside each other they must have separate overflows and in any case any overflow pipe should always discharge to a visible position Okay. Any large systems, very large systems, if it's got a capacity of over a thousand litres, they should it should have a separate warning pipe uh, fitted 25 mil below the overflow pipe um, to warn of a potential overflow situation. So this would be a, a much smaller pipe um, to to let the water out, so people know that there's an overflow before you get loads of water flowing out because obviously larger systems are going to have larger inlets much more water flowing through into them and therefore there's a real risk of, of wastage of water um, if they did start to overflow so a warning pipe would let us know um, that there was an issue before lots and lots of water started to flow away unused which is um, obviously one of the main points of the, the water regulations is to prevent wastage of water, so that helps us to, to meet that requirement. Okay, now it is time for your task. <laughs>